thank you, Lynn, for this nice introduction. It's been a very interesting and, and productive day so far, including the, the um, lecture by Liz Spelke earlier today, which is a real treat. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the um, invitation. It's a, um, my first talk is, um, for a while. Um, my, my family was maybe more than others impacted by the COVID pandemic. We had to basically stay in isolation until this summer. So I'm sort of trying to resurface as it were. And um, I'm, very, so I'm very glad to be sharing some of my um, work with you. I'll be talking about acoustic and linguistic um, processes that we use to um, um, understand or to decode or encode um, speech. Hearing, um, maybe I don't need to um, um, convince you about this, but I'll say it anyway, hearing is the, is the basis of um, um, human communication, or at least of much of um, human communication. And it's in fact speech and um, also arguably music are like uniquely human um, 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 signals or, um, or systems. Hearing, um, for better or worse, depending on whether you think the glass is half full or half empty, is also incredibly complex and sort of difficult to understand. So one, one um, um, sort of prototypical um, example that almost no talk about um, auditory perception can do without is the so-called cocktail party problem, where um, this is here, um, Breakfast at Tiffany's, a scene from Breakfast at uh, Tim Tiffany's, where um, two people, um, um, Javi Golaki and her um, oh, I forget his name. Do you remember his name? I'm, I'm blanking on his name now. Um, are having an um, interesting conversation, but um, they need to do this in front of um, a, um, um, a constant background noise or chatter. And not only um, human um, voices, but there might also be uh, an ambulance going by um, on the street below, or there's um, um, cutlery um, clattering, etc. So there's a, a very noisy scene. And the, the, um, the problem that we are faced with um, most of the times, not now um, when you're just listening to me, but when you're out and about, is to um, essentially detect the signal out of the um, background noises, so to, to disambiguate the signal from the background noise. And it turns out we do this um, almost effortlessly, except in some clinical conditions, but it's actually a super hard problem to understand computationally. Um, for example, um, most so-called automatic speech recognition systems, so it's the, the state of the art of um, um, computer um, um, sound to speech um, systems, they often miserably fail um, with their task of um, um, detecting the speech signal if there is um, background noise present. So it's a, actually a very, very difficult task. Every, um, incidentally, this, this sort of, um, oops, Leslie, will you deal with the, the new admits? <laughs> Sorry, I don't see them here now, just there. Um, they, um, it's a um, very different um, task that we have from um, vision. So in, audi in audition, the, the noise signals all um, and the speech signals or the, the signal um, forms a complex waveform, which we then need to sort of um, separate out. In vision, um, objects occlude each other. So they, they don't form this sort of complex additional um, um, scene, if you like, but they, they sort of, you have a different problem there, essentially. When hearing breaks down, the consequences can be severe. Um, they're the, maybe most, um, um, the, the easiest, if you like, um, um, of those conditions it may still be tinnitus, even though um, it can be pretty severe and, and debilitating. The, the more severe cases then are um, complete, um, are, are um, advanced hearing loss or even deafness. And, this can have multiple um, multiple consequences, obviously, including social isolation, depression, and and even suicidal tendencies. So <clears throat> today's talk is about um, speech and how we understand speech. Um, why, um, what I'm sort of trying to um, show you, or uh, hope convince you to uh, convince to show you, is um, that um, there are. Um, specific mechanisms with respect to 
temporal structure of speech that we can use or that we humans use in um, making sense of speech, how we comprehend speech. Speech um, itself is richly structured over time. There are these so-called linguistic units like phonemes, um, syllables, or words that all have distinct average durations. So they are all um, differently long, at least on average. Um, uh, phonemes are the, the shortest ones from anywhere between 20 to about 80 to um, a couple hundred milliseconds. Syllables are most in most cases um, two or more phonemes put together, though there's also instances, especially in English, of um, single phonemes also being um, syllables. And um, then you've got words, etc. This is here a, um, a waveform representation of um, a recording of someone saying mining a year of speech. And to um, a first approximation here, you've got the phonemes indicated down here. This is um, except this is actually correct, except for this this one here where the R should be indicated as another phoneme. But the idea is that you've got this very, very fast um, temporal information of these um, fricatives, for example, here, or these longer vowels here that are all very important for our ability to comprehend speech. In fact, um, uh, speech is intelligible with mostly these so-called temporal cues. So essentially the, 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 the temporal information that's conveyed in speech, if you, if you read speech off frequency information, so for example, um, 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 the, the, the pitch with which we speak, then it can still be comprehensible. The most famous example for this is the, the, um, the cochlear implants, which basically have very little pitch information in them, but you can still um, understand in most cases um, pitch with them. So since the um, since there is um, such an abundance of or since um, let's put it this way, since temporal information is so important for speech perception, it it uh, would make sense that to assume that the brain, the human brain, over its evolution, has developed some sort of special ways to deal with this temporal information with which. Um, speech is conveyed. For example, via neurons that have um, distinct temporal windows that are, for example, spe specialized or have so-called temporal windows of integration that are commensurate with the average duration of phonemes to average duration of syllables or words, etc. There's actually some evidence for that, and I'll show you some in, in this talk here. I'll show you um, three studies that all address in some way or other, slightly different ways, the, the question of how is the acoustic signal, speech signal that reaches our ears transfer, uh, transformed or mapped onto linguistic representations. This is still to this day, essentially the holy grail of speech research. Um, we, we all, we're, we're basically chipping away at various aspects of how this acoustolinguistic transformation, this sound to meaning mapping occurs, where it occurs, et cetera. Um, and the, the focus that I'm going to, presenting, uh, to be presenting here today is um, with respect to the temporal structure in speech. So what role does the temporal structure and play in this and um, where in the brain um, do we find evidence for this, um, this um, transformation to occur. I'll show you three studies. The first one um, focuses on um, um, acoustic level of analyses um, that um, we, we use to analyze temporal structure in speech. The second one will differentiate acoustic and linguistic um, mapping. So this will be the study that so gets at more at the, the question of where does this acoustolinguistic mapping going from sound to meaning occur. And then I'll show you one a recent study that I was very excited about. I'm still somewhat excited about. It's not yet published, but um, there's still some issues with it. Let's put it this way. Oh, if you have any questions, please interrupt or raise your hand at any moment. I'm, I'm very happy to take questions at any point.
Um, so there's um, a, a abundance, or lots of information that um, um, non-speech, so generic sounds are analyzed in, at um, different um, or discrete temporal scales. The most um, 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 obvious ones are um, investigating diff um, different amplitude modulation rates. So essentially the slower the amplitude modulation rate of a sound, um, the longer the temporal integration window, window and vice versa, the, the faster the mo um, amplitude modulation rate, the shorter the temporal inter inter um, integration window, presumably that you need to employ. And there's lots of um, lots of studies that have shown that the human brain is sensitive to these different types of temp temporal information rates. What is, so uh, the, the the question that we then asked was um, what about temporal scales in speech? Again, I said this um, um, uh, um, before. But it seems reasonable that there the brain might have evolved or um, 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 used over time mechanisms for encoding temporal structure that is specific for speech, and in particular that is so commensurate with the different units in speech, like phonemes, syllables, or words, etc. And this is um, this is how we went about um, investigating different. Um, temporal integration windows for speech or different temporal rates in speech. We started out with um, a um, uh, basically, actually we, we, took in, uh, we, we took inspiration from um, visual science like audio junior scientists um, often do. They're, they have a visual neuroscience complex. Essentially, we, we always feel like we're the, the, the ugly ducklings who don't know as much as the, uh, the people in the auditory. I, I, the, um, the researchers in the visual domain. So we um, we took inspiration from a, um, a um, image quilting algorithm that was then recently published, um, and we took this or so tried to convert this into the auditory domain. And if you um, what I'm showing here is the the um, a so-called spectrogram of a um, of somebody saying something. I'll play this. German. Um, this will become important later. Not that it's German, but that is a, a, a foreign language. Let's put it this way. But um, this is um, this is a spectrogram represent, representation of this um, acoustic signal on the um, y-axis is frequency on the um, x-axis is time and the different um, gray scales here indicate the, essentially the loudness of each individual cell of um, time and frequency. You can um, imagine this as an image that you can sort of decompose and quilt back together. This is essentially where the, the inspiration from the, um, from the visual domain came from. And this is how we went about this in order to um, investigate whether there are areas in the human auditory cortex that in, um, are sensitive to different levels of temporal um, information, we took a speech signal and chopped it up, for example, into short segments, for example, into 30 millisecond long segments. And then, um, this is one of the, the novelties of the study, um, we pseudo randomly rearrange those segments. And you need to do this very carefully because if you don't, then you get um, um, strong edge artifacts, which so, um, yeah, confound um, everything that you've done. Um, <clears throat> but we did this very carefully and such that essentially we um, ended up with a new speech like signal for which the um, natural temporal structure of speech was only had an extent of 30 milliseconds and then changed and 30 milliseconds etc so the the new speech quilt here as we call it has only only has natural temporal speech structure up to about 30 milliseconds I'll play you what this sounds like so so um, to, to some extent, the short phonemes are on, on average 30 to 60-ish milliseconds long. 
but they're also longer phonemes. So uh, vowels, for example, or or some nasals are actually longer in duration. So I'm I'm giving the uh, approximate durations um, of the the different linguistic units down here. So this um this is what the the speech built of thirty milliseconds sounds like. <laughs> And then, um, in the interest of time, I won't play all of them. Um, the the longest one that we um, that we used, the longest temporal window that we investigated, was um, about a second or nine hundred sixty milliseconds. And this is what this sounds like. Presumably, to most of you who don't understand speech, it's our sort of speech German, I should say. <laughs> um, to um, to those of you, I should say, who don't understand um, German, this should have sounded like perfectly normal German to you. If you had heard this and I told you this is um, German speech, you would have said, yes, sure, that's that's perfectly fine speech. And that this is just to sort of drive home the point that um, the, um, the algorithms that, that um, especially my colleague Josh McDermott um, the develop for this really do a very, very good job of getting rid of these edge artifacts and maintain the pitch, etc. So the, the logic of this approach is that um, neurons or neuronal ensembles, if you like, or maybe even an entire particle area that are sensitive to temporal structure in speech should respond maximally to speech quilts that are made of second lengths that match or exceed their temporal window of integration. And they should not respond or at least respond less to speech quilts that are made of segment lengths that are shorter than their temporal receptive fields. Does that make sense? I hope that that's sort of the, the underlying logic. And the, um, the, the other thing that I should stress maybe, maybe now before I forget, I tend to forget this fact is that um, we're looking here at um, the, the acoustic temporal processing of speech structure because all the stimuli um, that our participants were presented were German speech quilts or speech quilts from um, German people reading German books, essentially. Such, and the, the participants that, um, that, um, were, that participated in this study were all English speakers, American English speakers. So they did not understand any any German. So what we what we tested or the the the, the conditions that we tested were um, plentiful. Um, we had six what we call speech quilt conditions. These are essentially the ones that um, that I showed you. Um, uh, a thirty millisecond long segmented um, speech all the way to nine hundred and sixty millisecond segmented speech, we had two localizer conditions, which are essentially the same as those two conditions here, just to um, allow us to um, um, compute independent functional localizers, so areas for which um, the, the temporal structure um, sensitivity we could show. And then we had um, different control conditions, and I'll, I'll say more about these control conditions when, when we get there. We, 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 yeah, we, we scanned um, 16 participants. Um, it was a long, long study in, in the sense that we scanned them one to four um, times. Um, I basically bankrupted my advisor's um, R01 at the time. Um, <clears throat> so these are all, um, the, the participants are all native English speakers um, with no knowledge of German. So <clears throat> what we found was that areas that were responded more to 960 millisecond long segment lengths quilts to 30 millisecond long segment lengths were areas in the superior temporal sulcus both in the left and the right hemispheres. For reference, I'm also showing um, areas in Heschel's gyrus, aka to some degree at least, aka um, primary auditory cortex, and another important structure in auditory cortex, the so-called planum temporale. These two are anatomical regions of interest here in red and blue. The area that we found 
was sensitive to this temporal speech structure that responded more to more naturalistic or longer temporal windows in speech structure than to shorter temporal windows in speech structure was this area here in superior temporal sulcus in left and right hemispheres. Then we asked, what does the response actually look like? And this is what we found in um, Heschel's gyrus and PT, the left hemisphere and then the right hemisphere. And then um, I'm showing two different um, um, uh, functional regions of interest here. One is essentially the, um, the response in different, um, in different areas. Um, it, when, when we, when we um, created a so-called random effect group, um, a functional region of interest or um, um, and then computed the signal in this, um, or we in, um, independently for each subject um, created a functional region of interest only using the functional localizer stimuli, and then looked at the response in those. So what you can see down here is the, the segment duration. This is the, um, the proportion of the response to the, um, to the localizer 960 millisecond segment length condition and what you see very nicely is that at least certainly in the right hemisphere there's no change whatsoever in um, the earlier auditory regions in Heschel's gyrus and PT but once you get into SDS you get this strong response increase from short temporal windows of integration to longer temporal windows of integration. Now the next question so this is all and nice and good. We were excited about this. Um, the, the question we ask next is how specific or sensitive to speech is this? And the way we approach this is by creating new speech. Essentially, we um, used a, um, a, um, uh, another algorithm by, by um, Josh McDermott and his then um, postdoctoral advisor, Ira Simon Shelley from from NYU um, that essentially took um, or takes, um, analyzes a speech signal and um, extracts from it certain acoustic parameters like the, the overall frequency distribution, the modulation rates in it, et cetera. And then um, it uses those characteristics and superimposes them on a noise signal. And what you get is um, a new, speech signal that has exactly the same speech characteristics as the signal from the speech signal from which you derive them, but that is not quite speech yet because obviously it doesn't cover everything. If we, if we were able to do this, we could create new speech from, from scratch, but we are not quite there yet. But the idea is that um, we, um, we um, uh, created speech quilts not only from um, speech, but also from what the um, what we call these co-modulation control sounds. Essentially, the um, the cross-channel correlations, for example, so between channel um, correlations in normal speech are very very similar, at least in these um, in these co-modulation control sounds. So, to the first approximation, these um, these new sounds are like speech. They have many of the properties of speech, but are not quite speech. And the question is, do we find the same temporal sensitivity in SDS to these stimuli as to these real speech stimuli? And the answer is we do not. So I'm showing here um, the, the, the results only for the um, functional localizer and the two regions, um, um, anatomical um, regions of interest, Heschel's gyrus in red and PT in blue for the um, left hemisphere and right hemisphere again. And I'm, I'm presenting down here, the, um, the um, response for the speech 30 millisecond quilts and speech 900 millisecond quilts um, uh, conditions and the, the co-modulated control noise. Oh, actually, let me, I'll play you the others. Um, the the co-modulated controls, um, noise control sounds. And what you should focus on, or what I'll draw your attention to, is that um, you have this strong effect of the segment length in speech, but it's basically absent for these co-modulated control sounds here. 
right? So we um, we can say with, with some certainty or with some, um, what's the word? Um, certainty, let's put it this way, um, that um, what, we're, um, what we um, see here in this response here is not only due to so sort of low level acoustic characteristics in speech. You could also argue, however, or this, this is what we explored, whether um, maybe actually these, these um, co-modulation control sounds, they didn't sound very natural. So maybe the only reason why we didn't find anything here, but found something for speech was because um, speech is a natural signal and the other uh, um, the co-modulation control sounds were not. So what we did is we um, um, went to recordings that we, um, I forget where we got these from, um, not, not from the web, they, these were high levels of um, um, more, more um, high fidelity recordings of various natural sounds. And we again went and quilted those um, natural sounds, um, either with 30 millisecond long segments or with 900 millisecond long segments. I'll play you these. Can you hear this all right, I guess? Yeah, or you up. Okay. Good. <clears throat> or this one here. I'll have you guess what this is. It's I, I, I won't have you guess. It's obvious. Okay. <clears throat> so the the question <laughs> pigs, pigs, pigs. <clears throat> <laughs> you want to hear it again? Here you go. Hold on. This is a German thing. <laughs> of course. <laughs> So the, the, the question again is what, what um, we find. And essentially um, we find again that the, the, the response to this, um, to the um, speech sounds in superior temporal sulcus is um, as we saw before, or I should say the reason these are um, a little bit more noisy are because they, these are a subset of subjects that we ran. So essentially we, we, we ran these um, 16 subjects and we ran them um, a total of 52 times. And every time they we ran them, if they came back, we ran them with a different control condition set. Um, so, and um, it, the um, down here is the the response to the environmental control sounds. And yes, there is um, an effect, and that's I, I, if I remember correctly, that was sort of trend level um, significant at the time. Um, to these um, environmental, to the to this acoustic manipulation in the environmental control sounds, but um, um, it was obviously much um, smaller than in the um, in the speech sounds. So yes and no. And finally, um, one could argue that um, not all of the um, um, natural control sounds that we included had pitch in them. So maybe the the aspect in the speech signal that's that's driving this temporal sensitivity that we're finding is due to pitch. So we um, we um, took speech and um, noise vocoded it, which um, um, maybe it'll suffice here to say that it gets rid of all or most pitch information in a speech, but retains its temporal structure. And there again, we, um, we quilted the speech either at um, the noise vocoded speech, either at 30 milliseconds, <laughs> Or 960 milliseconds. Okay, so um, the the result here is that in this case we again get the, the strong result in the um, in the for the speech quilt conditions that we tested in this subset of of subjects, but we also get a strong response in um, for these speech for these noise recorded stimuli suggesting that um, 
the, what we what we uh, what we find is not due to pitch and prosody because the noise liquid stimuli did not have pitch and prosody in them, or at least certainly not pitch. Um, uh, but they were still showing this response. Okay. Um, I'll in the in the interest of time, I'll I'll um, unless there are questions, I'll go straight on to the next study. I basically said um, what I, I'm saying here already. So the, um, all of this was about the acoustic analysis of temporal speech structure. But of course, what we're most interested in or ultimately interested in is how does this um, acoustic temporal structure in speech um, map to linguistic representation so that we can actually um, understand each other. Um, so um, this is yeah. on your other, um, on your first one, I can still identify the language. On your second one, what behaviorally happens? Do I not need to hear this in language? Like the pig out here in language. How about your scramble or your non language one? A good question. So um, for those, you use it's very ambiguous what you hear. Um, for certainly for the longer temporal um, segment lengths, you can sort of discern that there it, it must be some kind of a voice or therefore a human that's producing these sounds, but it doesn't make any sense to you whatsoever. Um, for the for the noise the German doesn't either. I guess the, the German in that sense doesn't either. Yes. So we're um, the 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 um um, the um, explanation or the the, the um, reasoning for this is that these these co-modulation control sounds they capture something that is in the speech signal, but not necessarily something that's important for the temporal structure of the speech. So next, <coughs> we we um, we investigated exactly. Yes, sorry. Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, um, in in this study, um, since um, well, I'll leave away the synth part. Um, in this um, uh, first study, um, there was no significant difference between the left hemisphere, the the temporal sensitivity to or the sensitivity to temporal speech structure in the left and right hemispheres. We, for example, investigated how how large the the functional regions of interest were, and they were not different between the left and right hemispheres. So this is different from the in the studies that are coming up next. <laughs> no, no worries. So um, we next we ask that how and then also where, since we're um, performing fMRI, um, is the temporal um, structure of a speech or of the acoustic waveform mapped to um, linguistic representations? And in order to do this, we need um, to have um, on the one hand control over the temporal speech structure, and we. Um, do this again via the the um, the quilting algorithm. So this is the um, presumably enables us to look at the acoustic level of analysis. And secondly, we need control over the linguistic content of the information. And the way that we do this in this second study is that we compare exactly the same acoustic manipulation, the quilting algorithm, in a language that is familiar to you as well as in a language that is unfamiliar to you. In a language for which you have linguistic representations versus one um, for which you don't. So we, we can compare the same acoustic manipulation. The logic behind this is that if we find um, um, responses that increase as a function of segment length um, um, in both English and uh, Korean, in this case, or um, familiar versus unfamiliar languages, then presumably this would indicate a level of acoustic analysis if we find an interaction between the two, then you know, since we've applied the same acoustic manipulation, but we only find an effect in the um, in, in the familiar language, presumably this is because linguistic uh, linguistic processes have kicked in. Does that make sense? Um, we investigated this with a two by five um, um, design. I'll play you the actually this one here. Okay. And then the original stimulus. 
Just so we we um, recruited four perfectly bilingual um, English Korean speakers, perfectly bilingual in the sense that when we played their recordings to an English speaker, their English recordings to an English speaker, they said, yes, this is a native English speaker. When we played their recordings of reading from a Korean book to a Korean speaker, the Korean speaker said, yes, this is a perfectly um, reasonable um, Korean native speaker. We did this because we didn't want to have any noise confounds um, between the stimuli. So this way we could keep the same voices essentially, but the only difference was whether they were reading um, or speaking um, English or Korean. So first, um, <clears throat> let's look at the, um, the results for the acoustic analysis. We replicated in, in somewhat smaller form um, the original um, results for the foreign language. So we again found an area in the SDG slash STS um, down here. Um, that was sensitive to um, um, to original Korean versus 30 millisecond segment length um, Korean. And we also find an effect in, um, in English that is considerably larger. So let's look at what this what the results looked like. The original was 960 minus 30, not original minus 30. Correct, yes. So we <clears throat> In this study, we wanted to sort of maximize our power, as it as it were, to really go from from one extreme to the to the other. Whereas um, in the first one, we yeah, there were different. Sorry, do you still get the same bits with nine? nine yes, nine, essentially. Nine, yes, nine, yes, yes, we do. Um, so this is um, and and you can sort of see this here. This is again the 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 same um, layout as the previous ones. Um, just for um, English um, and Korean. And you can see very nicely that again, there's um, hardly any effect in the um, um, earlier auditory areas and um, a, a strong effect um, in the uh, functional regions of interest that we investigated. Um, and this is stronger in the, um, in the um, familiar language than in the, in the um, um, unfamiliar language. Now, uh, secondly, we looked for um, evidence for linguistic effects, and um, I noticed that in this, in um, the, it's not quite as strong here in the in the random effects analysis. But I think, if I remember correctly, 18 out of 19 out of the 19 subjects that we scanned, we, each of them had something in this left anterior frontal gyrus area. Each of them had activation in this left anterior frontal gyrus activation uh, area for um, this contrast here. So we um, performed the let leave one out participant functional region of interest analysis to investigate what's going on in this area in left inferior um, gyrus, AKA Broca's area. And this is what we found. So we found that essentially the Korean manipulation or the, the manipulation in Korean had no effect whatsoever in this area. Um, in left inferior frontal gyrus, but we found a strong effect in um, in this area for for um, the um, for the English manipulation. We also tested. Um, we performed a, um, a physiological uh, psychophysiological interaction analysis, essentially taking the left inferior frontal area region here as a seed and asked where in the brain does this activity in this area modulate the activity elsewhere. And what we found is that interestingly, and somewhat surprisingly to me at least, the, um, the area that it most, uh, that it sort of modulated most strongly were um, early areas in primary auditory cortex. I'm showing in, in red here, the original or the, the English, um, original versus English 30 contrast and um, in white, I'm showing areas of overlap between those. Any questions? So um, the, the, the idea here is that this linguistic processing that presumably um, takes place in um, left inferior frontal gyrus um, modulates via top-down mechanisms 
um, air, um, the activity in um, primary auditory cortex. And perhaps then, I'll come back, back to this at the very end, perhaps then this will modulate the um, activity in superior temporal cells. And I have some evidence for that. Okay, um, any questions about this? Then in the last um, few minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about this, this grand new study that I, um, I devised and, and so we're, we're, we're still analyzing. So this is maybe not quite hot off the presses, but like almost. Um, <clears throat> we, um, I had this idea that um, in so in so far we've we've done what we call um, time-based quilting. We chop up a speech signal in time segment into time segments, irrespective of what's actually going on at at any particular boundary point of this um, segment here. But of course, there's many linguistic units that are in, in important for speech as one. Um, that I've um, shown here before. So essentially the, um, the phonemes are the smallest perceptual unit that let us differentiate um, meaning or de determine meaning. So um, between these two words here, pin and chin, the only difference is the, the initial um, consonant here. And um, that lets us hear them as two different words. Um, it turns out, and this was the inspiration for this study, very nice study from um, Nima Mescarani's lab at, at Columbia, where they um, presented speech, normal recordings, natural recordings of people reading a book um, to their um, participants while um, recording EEG activity. And then um, what they um, got from their EEG activity, they um, got um, what they called phoneme related potentials. So essentially they, they um, separated the speech input signal into different phonemes. You can do this via the um, so-called um, pen porcelain aligner, University of Pennsylvania, um, um, I forget, phonetics lab, I think, um, uh, Charlie Lieberman's group, essentially. Um, do, you, um, do you have the acoustic speech signal? If you also give it the, um, the um, translation, the transcription of that, then um, it will tell you where in the acoustic speech signal each phoneme occurred or started and ended. And that this is what they did. They essentially um, um, created phoneme related potentials to plosive phonemes, fricatives, nasals, and um, vowels, and found that they all have different um, signatures, if you'd like. So the idea is here that these um, phoneme related potentials presumably reflect acoustic characteristics because obviously the different phoneme classes have different acoustic um, properties. And the, the question I wanted to um, ask here is whether they are also, whether we can show that they are also malleable to linguistic processes, just like we have shown um, that the, the, the temporal processing of speech is malleable to temporal um, speech structure or the extent of temporal speech structure. So this is um, um, what this study investigated. We went from what I call, again, time-based filtering to speech-based filtering. We took the um, speech signal, um, we isolated the phonemes um, um, we, using the pen phonetic lab for the Lionel and a, a equivalent for Korean speech, and then um, pseudo-randomly scrambled phonemes. And I'll play you, these are the last two sounds, I'll play you. And green. So, so in this case, you can actually start to hear um, a, a differentiation between the, the, the two languages already, which um, was very, very hard to do for the 30 millisecond section of length. Presumably, and I'll get back to that if I don't forget, presu uh, presumably because the, the phonemes themselves are um, on average longer and they're not as distorted via the random onset of the segment length as in the 30 or even 60 millisecond speech segment length conditions. And so we, um, we went even simpler in this way, in this one, we went um, to a um, two by two 
um, um, design where we compared familiar languages, uh, familiar and unfamiliar languages with original and phoneme built stimuli. The task um, was to um, to count the uh, so the, the stimuli were in this case uh, slightly different in the sense that they were longer, thirty three seconds long. Um, we we did this because we wanted to um, essentially discard the onset response. We wanted to have sort of clean data that only is responding to the to the phonemes or phoneme classes that we're we're tracking, um, and not um, so corrupted if you like or drowned out by, for example, the onset response. And we um, um, had the participants to uh, um, attend to the sound and tell us how many times the speaker in, in the 33 seconds changed. We, um, we did, um, in this case, a, 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 a new and slightly different analysis in the sense that we um, uh, used two classes of predictors for our analysis. So. The, in, in the, in the previous two um, analyses, they were based very, if you like, traditional, based on GLM models, general linear models of the hemodynamic response function. Here, um, we're using two different classes of predictors, three acoustic predictors and four um, um, phoneme predictors to explain the data. We are essentially asking how well do these predictors um, explain the data, and is there any difference between the languages then? <clears throat> what we find is um, that um, for the, the main effect of quilting, so regardless of languages, we find um, um, a, a strong effect again in the superior temporal sulcus region, and we find a, a, a similarly strong effect for, um, for the languages. So that essentially the, the activity is stronger in these areas for English than Korean, maybe not super surprisingly. What we were most interested in, um, at least initially, was the interaction of the two. And this is what this um, figure here shows that um, in, in this case, it was actually um, um, left lateralized, which kind of surprised us, even though you can still see that there's maybe subthreshold effects um, in the in the right STS also. So, so this is the, the interaction which essentially shows that there's a, a greater effect of quilting, speech-based quilting in English than in Korean. So this is again evidence for linguistic processing. We were kind of um, hoping for us to be able to see something here also, but um, unfortunately that was not, at least it didn't. Um, survive significance, the, the significant significance threshold. And that's across people. That's across people. So in the ROI, you can see. Pardon? Don't, don't average across all people. Oh. Do an ROI, you're going to find the person. You're not getting it. You're getting it. That, that's a good point. Yes, we have to go. That's it's a good point. We, we, we can go back to that. Yeah. Can you also define the question? Um, so the, these are, these are cluster level um, cluster level significance thresholds or or areas that survive the I should say the cluster level um, the significance threshold. Yes. The right there. The 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 black outlined part One here. Black. The original line is control. Uh, for the for the contrast for the interaction contrast English original greater than English quilt phoneme quilt greater than the same contrast for Korean. So this, this uh, again, this is this is an area that shows a greater effect of the quilting in the familiar language than the the unfamiliar language. I know that. That's the red, correct? That's What's the black outline around the red. That's Did the you just outline it? We just outlined oh, it. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, that was the misunderstanding. Yes, so that, that just indicates the area or okay. area, um, yes, single area where the cluster level threshold was exceeded. Yes. Next, I'm I'm almost there. Um next we, we checked to what extent the um two classes of predictors that we were using, the the acoustic predictors, which is were the um the broadband envelope and the the um, rectified versions of the 
um, of its first derivative, the rectified po positive first derivative and rectified negative derivative, essentially the onsets, sound onsets versus sound offsets. Um, and um, how, how well the acoustic predictors as well as the four phonetic predictors explain, were able to explain the data. Not surprisingly, the um, acoustic predictors um, um, showed an overall greater predictive effect than the than the um, um, phonetic predictors. And interestingly, also maybe not super surprising, the, the effects were mostly concentrated in earlier auditory areas, including this one here is primary auditory cortex on the left and uh, the right here. Then um, most importantly, um, we wanted to, or we, we tested whether this effect here that we saw um, for, the, for the interaction, whether that was most unique to the acoustic predictors or could be best explained by the acoustic predictors or the linguistic predictors. And um, to our disappointment, we found that um, it could not. So basically, uh, put differently, the, um, the effect here that we see here um, cannot be um, um, explained by a unique contribution of either the language or the, the uh, linguistic predictors or the acoustic predictors. It, they can, uh, they only work together, if you like, um, to explain this, which if you think back or when I thought back about this, I thought, well, this, this makes actually some sense because, let me show you one more slide, go back here. Um, this is also essentially what we found in the previous study that um, we, we, we essentially find a, um, we not only find the interaction between um, English or between language and quilting here, but in fact, the, the Korean, in the Korean response, we find the, an acoustic response as well as then a larger response in the, in the English version, which suggests that both, um, both um, acoustic and phonetic processes might be at play in this superior temple sulcus region here. Okay, finally, um, unfortunately, this, this is why I said it, it's still um, um, a little bit disappointing to me, the study, um, or at least not all hypotheses that we had are confirmed. Um, we found essentially no, I, I, no equivalence to the EEG phoneme related potentials. We found no stable, um, at least so far, topography of different phoneme classes and also um, therefore, we found no evidence that these, um, the encoding of these phoneme classes is malleable to linguistic processing. So um, by, by, the, um, by the quilting procedure, the, the interaction of the quilting procedure and the, the, the languages. And finally, we also found no left in, 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 um, interaction left IFG, so I'll go back to that. Okay, final two slides, I promise, and then, then I'm done. I wanted to leave you with how, how I think about this in terms of a, a sort of model perspective, if you like. So the, the way I think about that acoustic-linguistic based on the results that I've shown you. The way I think about this acoustic-linguistic transformation of temporal speech structure, the important, uh, the, the emphasis here being on temporal speech structure, because this is obviously not something new. I mean, many people have looked at um, acoustic-linguistic transformations, but um, what we're looking at here is um, with a specific em emphasis on temporal speech structure, is that um, the um, um, input comes into here, the, the SDG and primary auditory cortex region, then is passed forward for temporal analysis to um, STS. And if, um, um, if it's uh, sort of linguistically relevant, it's passed on to left interior frontal gyrus. And the PPI analysis showed us or suggested that this then modulates the um, activity in earlier auditory regions. This was the um, PPI analysis of the second study that I showed you. And importantly, um, once, once this has been done, then this could then, so this information or this, this modulation here then could further modulate the, um, the activity in SDS, which look down here, which, um, would indicate which, which would result in a stronger effect in this interaction effect in um, the 
um, area in left SDS or right SDS also in the previous study. Um, here, um, strong effect for the familiar language than for the unfamiliar language. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's it. Thank you um, all. And I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>